Your Majesty the King, Your Majesty the Gelfin, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to welcome you all to this evening's Second Friday Forum Lecture at the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies. The theme for tonight's lecture is Democracy and Development and will be de delivered by His Excellency Dr. Sh Shashit Tharoor, the Indian Minister of State for Human Resource Development. Your Excellency, I, on behalf of the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies, would like to warmly welcome you, Your Excellency, to Bhutan, and thank you specifically for taking time away from your busy schedule to give us a talk on democracy and development on the joyous occasion of His Majesty's fifth coronation anniversary. I would now like to invite course participant Lobzang Rinzen Yarge to give the welcome address. Your Majesty the King, Your Majesty the Gelsin, Your Excellency Dr. Shashi Tharoor, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and an, an honor as one of the course participants of the first batch of the senior executive level program to welcome you to the second Friday Forum Lecture at the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies. The RICS is a gift from the throne, established under the direct initiative, guidance, and the patronage of His Majesty the King, the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies aims to promote excellence in governance, leadership, and strategic studies. It is a forum to train both incumbent and potential leaders in major areas of uh, nation building. It is an institute which provides high quality education and discourses on governance, public policy, and leadership. RIGS aims to provide a think tank that will engage in critical thinking and research. It is an incubator for new ideas and nurture leaders to lead changes in Bhutan and beyond. We, the trainees of the first batch of the senior executive level program are truly grateful to His Majesty the King and the RICS for giving us the opportunity to avail this inaugural program in this prestigious institute. We will be constantly mindful of this privilege and work hard to be worthy of this lifetime opportunity to gain skills to not only lead our fellow citizens, but most importantly, change and lead ourselves the leadership of the self. The Friday Forum Lecture is one of the most important events of the senior executive level program, where eminent national and international leaders and famous personalities are invited to speak on the relevant subjects and current themes. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have with us His Excellency Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Minister of State for Human Resource Development, Government of India. Your Excellency, on behalf of the RICS, the course participants, and I, on my own behalf, would like to welcome you and your wife to Bhutan, and most importantly, welcome to the RICS. In a world that is becoming competitive, globalized, and sophisticated, it is imperative for countries to have leaders and managers who can not only deal with the current challenges, but also anticipate and prepare for future. Particularly for a country like Bhutan, given our geopolitical realities and economic challenges, our leaders must have a vision that is common and collective, far-reaching yet contemporary, reflecting the aspirations of every single citizen and the country as a whole. 
Having embarked on the journey of democratic transition, it is only logical that we hear about this important subject from the experts in the field. As we know, tonight, Dr. Shaji Tharoor will speak on the theme of democracy and development on this much-awaited second Friday Forum lecture. May I now present a synopsis of His, His Excellency's illustrious career and rich CV. Dr. Shashi Tharoor is a member of parliament from the Thiruvananthapuram constituency of Kerala. He was the former, state of, former Minister of State for External Affairs, Government of India, and the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations. His Excellency is now the Minister of State for Human Resource Development, Government of India. Dr. Shashi Tharoor is a prize winning author of 14 books. He is a widely published critic, commentator, and a columnist. He served the United Nations during a 29 year career in refugee work and peacekeeping. In 2006, he was the India's candidate to succeed Kofi Annan as UN Secretary General. He has won India's highest honor for overseas Indian, the Pravasi Bharatiya Saman. He is also the recipient of numerous literary awards, including a Commonwealth Writers Prize. Dr. Tharoor is an internationally acclaimed speaker on India's recent transformation and future prospects, globalization, freedom of the press, human rights, literacy, Indian culture, and India's present and potential influence in the world politics. Born in London, Dr. Tharoor got his education in India and the United States, where he completed his PhD at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Dr. Tharoor was also awarded an honorary doctorate in history by the University of Bucharest, Romania. A compelling and effective speaker, he is fluent in English, French, Malayalam, and Hindi. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming once again Dr. and Mrs. Tharoor to Bhutan and to the RICS. Thank you. Thank you, Lobzong. I now invite His Excellency Dr. Shashi Tharoor to deliver the lecture. Your Majesty the King, Your Majesty the Gyaltsen, Honorable Ministers and distinguished members of the Government of Bhutan, His Excellency the Ambassador of India, participants in the Senior Executive Development Program, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, first of all, for that generous introduction. I must say, I have to take my heart off to you. It's not very often in India that someone can pronounce Tiruvananthapuram correctly. That was, that was wonderfully done. But it was also apparent from the rest of the introduction that this, this young and very capable young official had looked me up on the internet because it was apparent from the details that he was able to inflict upon you that he had done that. And you know, these days, whenever you speak, you're always worried what people will find about you on the internet when they introduce you. Uh, sometimes they may not actually be things you've done, but today there was no such problem. But I had a friend in New York when I was at the UN who not only looked up the speakers by uh, what they had done on that they could find on the internet, but also looked up the family tree, the deeds and misdeeds of parents and grandparents and so on. So he was going to introduce a speaker and he found that this gentleman had an uncle who had been electrocuted at Sing Sing prison in the electric chair for kidnapping and armed robbery or something equally horrible. But having taken the trouble to look it up, he felt he had to use it. And of course, in introductions, you have to be very nice. So he said, well, this distinguished speaker, he said, had an uncle who occupied the chair of applied electricity at one of the nation's leading institutions. <laughs> so this is just by way of saying that these kind introductions should always be taken with a pinch of salt. But I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's a genuine honor to be present at the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies for the Friday Forum Lecture. 
established entirely, as you've already said, due to the vision of His Majesty Jigme Khesar Namgyel Wangchuk, a monarch with deep democratic instincts. The Royal Institute in this splendid building, my wife and I were admiring it as we drove up here, um, here in, in Funchaling, bids fair to be the premier institution in the country committed to creating the leaders of tomorrow's Bhutan. We live in an era where uh, successful nation building is recognized not just as a matter of good governance, but is also an act of collective imagination, sustained by creative diplomacy abroad and result-oriented public policies at home. I'm sure that this institution will prove to be the cornerstone of Bhutan's development and transformation for many years to come. Bhutan has been memorably described in an article for Time magazine as the last authentic place on earth. Now, I don't know your country well, I've only been here once before, but I could not agree more. For the city dweller in me, all the pristine natural beauty that I saw seemed nothing less than magical. Being uh, here, what is it, about five years ago, just before the previous elections, in fact, I realized that the reason for Bhutan's ability to attract tourists in this beautiful landscape is because it has held on to its biodiversity, untouched and unsullied by the march of what modern institutions call progress, like very, very few nations in the world have been able to. Bhutan's constitution gives environmental protection a constitutional status. I must compliment the leaders of this country who have not been seduced by short-term gains and have truly understood the importance of aligning modernity with traditional values by according natural wealth, traditional customs, a significance and status that verges on the divine. We see it in your traditional clothing, which I think is, a, is, 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 is an act of great homage to your culture and your ways of conducting yourself, which is also extremely anchored in that history. And at the same time, we've seen the growth and progress in Bhutan the Bhutanese concept of gross national happiness, which incorporates environment and cultural protections, is an invaluable contribution to development discourse. Now, as the world's youngest democracy today, Bhutan is navigating the modern world while holding on to its rich past and building its future. To those who are passionately engaged with Bhutan, and India stands at their forefront, the political reforms seen in 2008 represented the culmination of the evolution of this kingdom over the past 107 years. This is due to the commitment of successive rulers of this dynasty to reforms which have kept pace with time, the changing world, and the needs and expectations of the people of Bhutan. I still remember my conversations with various leading figures here a few weeks before the elections of 2008. The excitement and uncertainty in the air, the curiosity about other democratic systems, especially India's, the thorough homework done by your Chief Justice, uh, your Supreme your Speaker, and other prominent political figures about the mechanisms and processes of democracy. The transition to democracy might have been a surprise to many, but before it occurred, it was well prepared. Has Bhutan's tryst with democracy been a success? The answer in five years is an unqualified yes. Many societies see democracy as an instrument that helps them to attain their national objectives. This, in my view, is too limited a reading of the democratic ideal and the moral core that gives it vitality and that was at the heart of the former monarch's choice of democracy. Of course, democracy is a means to an end, but it is also an end in itself. In recent years, the country has seen better roads, has been better connected to the world with the internet, standards of living and health indicators have all sprung upwards. But it's no surprise, too, that with the advent of democracy, some are warning that the country, like its big neighbor to the south, could also fall prey to incidents of corruption or alleged political wrongdoing. At the same time, there is renewed focus towards issues which affect the common man the most, which include drinking water, agricultural development, a 
and the conflict of humans with wildlife in rural Bhutan. So this brings us to the theme of my talk this evening, the larger question of development and democracy in today's world, and of course their role in a state like Bhutan. It's a common adage that good governance promotes growth and that growth further improves governance. In this two-way street, where do young governments like Bhutan's find their place while the world changes at a rapid pace? Today, development and democracy as concepts are being refined. Development as a concept is seen as one where there is a general improvement in the lives of people for a large part of the population. This is usually measured in gross domestic product, GDP growth, as well as in the fulfillment of political, social, and economic rights. Democracy, well, impossible to define, perhaps. I think everyone remembers Abraham Lincoln's classic definition, uh, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Simple enough. Um, Winston Churchill said that democracy is the worst system of government in the world, except for all the others. So people have tried to, to talk about democracy, but in many ways, today we should see it as a foundation for development. <coughs> one which goes beyond mere economic growth and a tool which delivers better governance which in turn leads to better quality of life for ordinary people. Now as a person who has spent the better part of his life in the United Nations and then in now in the last five years in the Parliament of India and as a minister in the government I see democracy and development as intertwined concepts. As good governance has found a place in the United Nations Millennium Development Goals and a democratic system has become an increasingly important criterion to receive international aid, it is important that we explore the link between democracy and development in both theory and practice. But what is good governance? Good governance includes a variety of factors such as accountability, transparency, equitable treatment, inclusiveness and the rule of law. These values are not always in harmony with each other, but then managing them is the primary task of politics in a democracy. While it may also seem a glaring generalization, these are qualities that more often than not are amply found in democracies around the world. Research has shown that democracy can successfully create institutions which promote good governance and development across several indices. My good friend, the distinguished Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, has pers persuasively argued over the years that democracy as a system of government is in fact a form of public reasoning, the outcome of which emerges through elections. Democracy gives all citizens effective political and civil rights while having the ability to deliver welfare to the poor. For Sen, a nation is not fit for democracy. Rather, it becomes fit through democracy. Democracy's special strength is in its responsiveness to the needs of the people, rather than merely the wishes of the rulers. One of Sen's most enduring insights is that a substantial famine has never occurred in a nation which has a democratic government and a relatively free press. This concern for public welfare is a characteristic of democracy. An analysis of 44 African states in the year 2005 revealed that under democracies, they saw their expenditure on education shoot up. Research has shown that there is a healthy correlation between democracy and higher government spending on public health, education, and social services. In the long run, democracies tend to respect property rights, individual liberties, and collective freedom all of which promote human development. These freedoms recognize the importance of human dignity and allow citizens to be able to defend their interests in appropriate forums, develop their strengths and potential, and give themselves opportunities to grow while taking their families and communities on the path to progress. Democracy is also far more responsive to the people, for they go to them periodically in the form of elections. I know you've just had your second one this year, to renew their mandate and appeal for their mandate to remain in power. Democratic governments can never dispense with the consent of the people to maintain their legitimacy. 
This is a defining characteristic of political power in democratic societies. This periodic exercise of reaffirming public confidence in political authority in turn helps speed up the developmental process for the people. Democracies are also conducive to internal and external peace, without which development becomes difficult to pursue. Democracy is the best system for managing diversity. In multi-religious, multi-ethnic countries, a country like India, for example, democracy permits citizens to determine their own way of life under a state which accommodates divergent religious practices without privileging any. I know Bhutan doesn't have this challenge, but it's an example, and this gives citizens the right to grow in an environment which fosters harmony and stability. Now, of course, all is not sweetness and light. Democracies allow disagreements to be openly expressed. But the process of free and fair public discussion and contestation gives people the power to be stakeholders in combating social issues of a local nature without the state suppressing them or coercing an outcome. Such constructive processes, which play a crucial role in developing the character of a democratic people, are unlikely to occur in an undemocratic state. Now, when we talk about democracy and development, I'm sometimes reminded of an argument between, so it is said, an American and a French diplomat of the UN Security Council, where the American diplomat says, you know, we can solve this problem. If we do this and this and this, we can solve the problem. And the French diplomat says, yes, 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 that will work in practice, but will it work in theory? I hope that doesn't sound like some of your professors at Riggs. Huh? The fact is that the theory is obviously contested ground. There are some who dismiss the very arguments for democracy that I have made this evening, especially in our Asian continent. The former Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, once said, I believe what a country needs to develop is discipline more than democracy. The exuberance of democracy, he said, leads to indiscipline and disorderly conduct which are inimical to development, unquote. Nations in East Asia have largely been led by this kind of thought process and have not seen substantially democratic governments during what was termed as their miracle years of growth when they became the Asian tigers. Yet, a lot of the methods employed by these nations to bring in development, which include economic competition, use of international markets, spread of education and land reforms, have in fact been consistent with democratic principles. And even as these East Asian economies have grown richer, the desire of their people to experience more democratic freedoms has also deepened. Many formerly authoritarian states in East Asia have become democracies, at no cost, I might add, to their development success stories. Look at South Korea, for example. While rapid industrialization leading to development has also been seen in other authoritarian regimes, it has often come at great cost in human suffering. I once made myself a bit notorious by saying, well, China may have grown at breakneck speed, but when you grow at breakneck speed, you also break a few necks. And that we don't want to do in India. While not all democracies have been able to deliver substantial development, it must also be noted that this difference can be sourced to the investment each society made towards institution building and development within the country. This is also the reason that countries in East Asia have done better with few democratic processes in play. Now, I mentioned China. Uh, it is fashionable sometimes to put up the example of China against this argument. But this begs the question, is China's extraordinary growth story without democracy due to its authoritarian government, or is it due to its skilled and hardworking population, which attracted considerable foreign investment in an export-centered model of development? Though it's still far away from democracy, by the way, its freer economic system has made China a more open country today and greater popular participation in economic and gradually political decision-making is already beginning to happen. Now, the East Asian examples have led some to suggest that poor countries cannot afford democracy and that once they developed under autocratic rule, democratization can follow. 
In other words, democracy has been seen as a hallmark of developed countries only, countries with a certain level of per capita income. But the Indian experience has given the lie to this theory, as have many African democracies. It has been found in Latin America that democracies recovering from communist rule and military dictatorships in the 1980s were the ones which introduced the most inclusive economic reforms, leading their population towards greater development, economic and otherwise. India, of course, is a prime example of democracy. At a time when most developing countries opted for authoritarian methods of government, they said it was to promote nation building and to direct their development, India consciously chose to be a multi-party democracy. And despite many stresses and strains, including 22 months of emergency rule in the mid-1970s, India has remained a multi-party democracy. Freewheeling, rumbustious, Corrupt and inefficient, perhaps, but nonetheless flourishing. One result of this is that India strikes many as maddening, chaotic, inefficient, and seemingly lacking direction as it apparently muddles its way through the second decade of the 21st century. Yet, it works because it brings all its citizens along in this great adventure of development. In fact, India's economic liberalization in 1991 and subsequent years of record growth occurred despite fractious democracy, despite coalition governments and a decade in which different political parties each had a turn of power. So democracy was not in any way an impediment to rapid development. Our institutions, both formal and informal, allowed economic reforms to reach the lowest rung of the population, helping us, fuel, help, helping us to pull millions above the poverty line and allowing them to climb the social and economic ladders of life to a better quality of life. In the last two decades, India has um, pulled more people out of poverty than in the years before liberalization, averaging something more than 10 million people a year in the last decade. The country has visibly prospered, and despite population growth, per capita income has grown faster and higher in each of these years than ever before. So these changes have occurred within democracy and the legitimacy of democracy in India comes from the faith of vast numbers of the underprivileged rather than our relatively minuscule elite or even our more numerous middle class. It is the poor who turn out in large numbers to vote because the poor know that their votes matter. You know, when I lived in New York during the, uh, my UN days, I noticed that in the largely poor and, and predominantly black area of Harlem until the election in which Barack Obama was a candidate, but until then, the turnout in a presidential election never exceeded 27%. Whereas in India, it's the opposite. It's the poor who come out in large numbers, stand in the queue in the hot sun to cast their vote because they know their ballots make a difference. There have been studies done showing the percentage of turnout in the poorest sections of our society is much larger than in that of the affluent. So democracy is entrenched at the bottom of our society. The people also believe that exerting their franchise is the most effective means of demonstrating what they really demand from the government. Even frustration with the government manifests itself in voting against the rulers rather than in revolts or insurrections. When violent movements do arise, they're often diffused through accommodation in the democratic process, so that in state after state, yesterday's militants become today's chief ministers, and thanks to the vagaries of democracy, tomorrow's leaders of the opposition. Now, through these years, India's challenges have been enormous. Our growth was never only about per capita income figures. It was always a means to an end. And the ends we cared about were the uplift of the weaker sections of our society, the expansion of employment possibilities for them, the provision of decent health care and clean drinking water. Those ends still remain. Whether we grow by 9% as we once did, or by 5% as we seem to be doing now, our fundamental commitment must be to the bottom 25% of our society. Democracy ensures that. The Indian example proves that democracy can manage the most complex social systems with dexterity to create and execute policies which have far-reaching effects. 
without disrupting either society or state. The research has also shown that second generation reforms like banking and financial sector reforms and anti-corruption measures amongst others requires competencies and political attributes which only democracy can offer. Indeed, the absence of democracy can stifle development. The political scientist Larry Diamond once happily said that predatory, corrupt, wasteful, abusive, tyrannical, incompetent governance is the bane of development. Young nations need democratic institutions to respond to their populations, to weed out corruption, have access to the lower sections of society to understand their problems, and formulate policies which can counter them. While these measures actively lay the foundation of human development, these will come to nothing if a nation does not make its institutions accountable to the people through a free press and judiciary. In democratic systems, development and prosperity fuels further growth through a virtuous cycle. Histor historical experience tells us that development in a democratic society creates an educated and enlightened middle class which creates for itself additional opportunities to explore and expand the political arena. Empowered people articulate their needs better while they press for social and political freedoms. In fact, there is no question that democracies can create an open line of discourse between the government and the public so that their voices are heard and priorities noted. Democracy is also a necessity to allow people to become creative in pursuing their goals. Democracy fosters an environment of openness, giving opportunities to people to take risks. It permits citizens access to information, assures them the right to express themselves freely without fear of repercussions. The ability to think and debate freely without censorship frees the imagination, leading to innovative practices which are the cornerstone of development. We live in a time where the challenges we face can be tackled only with creative and innovative practices. Democracies have historically been better at innovation than authoritarian systems, which stifle and suppress original thought. In authoritarian systems, everything must be done a certain way, usually because it's always been done that way or because the rulers say so. In democracies, there's much more room for out-of-the-box thinking. On a lighter note, I should probably share with you the example of out-of-the-box thinking that I'm wearing. You know, I need glasses for distance. I don't need glasses to talk to the people sitting next to me, to read a text, to see the people in the front. But if I wanted to take a good look at His Majesty at the back, I would actually have to put on glasses. So I carry them, but I hardly ever wear them. And usually I shove them in a pocket, I bang against a wall, they break, or I put them on my lap when I'm sitting down, they fall down, somebody steps on them, I leave them on a table. In the first three months of this year, I lost or broke six pairs of glasses. So I said to a friend, what do I do? You know, I really need uh, a better solution because I can't keep on spending a fortune buying glasses. So he said, but can't you think of glasses differently? What's the matter? I said, you know, because all glasses for 150 years, I joined in the middle, even the so-called... Uh, rimless spectacles are joined in the middle and they hang over your ears and that's what I don't like so I always take them off. He said, there is a solution, out of the box thinking. Let us reimagine glasses in a way that they're not what they've always looked like for 150 years. And this is the result. I'm wearing it around my neck and when I want to look at his majesty, I just do that, click together with a pair of magnets in the middle, I can say hello and I can take it off again to look at you right here. It's a very simple thing, but as a result, I don't lose and break my glasses anymore. And for the last seven months of this year, this has been my only pair of glasses for everyday use. I mention this not because it has anything much to do with democracy or development, except one thing. It was invented in a democracy. Because in democracies, you are prepared to think creatively, to innovate out of the box. One of India's great strengths is if you go and Google the words frugal innovation, you will find the first 20 results all relate to India. And that's because India is a country where people are prepared to think of things differently. And so Indians have invented in recent years the world's cheapest electrocardiogram, the world's cheapest biotech insulin injections, the world's cheapest and smallest a small car, the Tata Nano, and so on and so forth, by taking products that exist before and stripping them down to their essentials to make them affordable, replicable, and suited to local conditions. Now, some experts have argued that democracy does not lend itself to rapid development, that the compromises, which are in fact an essential element 
of democratic governance. And the need for decision makers in a democratic society to take the wants of their constituents into account are distractions that less developed states could ill afford if they are to make the hard decisions necessary to improve their futures. Of course, this argument rests on a set of assumptions that countries like India have never accepted. Now, when I speak about assumptions, I realize I've been talking for quite a while and that you're expecting me to talk even longer. So given the late hour, I think I will inflict on you a story about assumptions. It's, it's one of my favorite stories, actually, about international misunderstandings coming from assumptions. It goes back to the days when the Americans used to advise us in India about agriculture before our Green Revolution. So the story goes that one day an American agricultural expert, a big farmer from America, arrived in India, and he was received very hospitably by his Indian host, an Indian farmer, who, because of land reform and population pressures, his land was pretty small, not much larger than this auditorium, but he said very proudly to the American, you know, all this is my land. He said, you see that national highway? And the American looked and he saw a dirt road. The Indian said, my land goes all the way up to there. And he says, do you see this irrigation canal? And the American looks and he sees really a trickle of water. But the Indian says proudly, my land goes all the way up to there. And then he says to the American, what about you? But the American is a farmer from Kansas, or so one of these Midwestern prairie states, where the wheat fields roll on for miles on end. So he clears the throat and says, well, in the morning I get into my tractor and I drive two hours to the northern boundary of my land. He says, and then it's another two and a half hours in my tractor to the western boundary of my land, and I break for a sandwich. Then I get into my tractor, and it's three hours down to the southern boundary of my land. He says, and then it's another hour and a half in my tractor to the eastern boundary of my land, and finally it's sundown, and I get, a get into my tractor. It takes me another hour to get back to the ranch house. So he finds the Indian nodding very sympathetically. I know, I know, says the Indian. I too used to have a tractor like that. <laughs> now the purpose of the story, aside from making sure you were still awake, is that what you understand depends on what your assumptions are. What are the assumptions that you can take the same set of facts, two people, and understand different things because you're bringing a different mindset to your assumptions. So what are the assumptions about democracy and development we're facing today? You know, one of the dangerous assumptions, I know that Bhutan has never been prey to this, is the assumption that development is solely about generating wealth. In fact, the Christian Bible in three different places offers the undoubted wisdom that man does not live by bread alone. And neither, I might add, does woman. Now, after all, why does man need bread? Of course, to survive. But why bother to survive if it's only to eat more bread? Right? I mean, life is about much more than survival. Life is about enriching the process of human development, and democracy recognizes that. Democracy recognizing it by giving life an opportunity to flower in all its creative forms. And we in India are, perhaps uniquely amongst the large democracies, very well aware that neither man nor woman, nor country nor state, will live well or long unless adequate attention is given to both the baking and distribution of bread, the boiling of rice, the rolling of chapatis, that is also why democracies are attentive to development, because no democratic government will survive if the poor do not have bread. Bread and de democracy go together. And just as we are aware and proud of the strong democratic traditions in today's world, we're also aware of our responsibility to develop, to seek to bring all our people into the 21st century with comfortably full bellies and comfortably fulfilling occupations. Democracy and human rights are fundamental to who we are, but human rights begin with breakfast. So countries like modern India have struggled to come to terms with what has sometimes been seen as the competing demands of freedom and development, just as we've struggled with the need to fully respect diversity and at the same time pay homage and respect to our sense of identity. You have a very clear sense of identity in Bhutan, I respect that greatly. I've always argued that democracy as both precept and practice will never wear the mantle of perfection. I've written in my books of the many problems that India faces, the poor quality of much of its political leadership, the rampant corruption, the criminalization even of politics. And yet we find that democracy finds its own solutions to these ills. 
Corruption is being tackled by investigative agencies, by an activist judiciary. And, and in fact, the most powerful Indian politicians have been indicted in this process. Of course, if only the rate of convictions matched the rate of indictments, perhaps it would be even better. The rule of law remains a vital Indian strength. Non-governmental organizations actively defend human rights, promoting environmentalism, fighting injustice. The press is lively, free, irreverent, and disdainful of sacred cows. All this is possible only in a democracy. So India's democracy is a strength and not a weakness. It is a strength that India has preserved an idea of itself as one land embracing many. A country that endures differences of caste, creed, color, culture, cuisine, conviction, costume and custom, and still rallies around a democratic consensus. And that consensus is that in the, on the simple idea that in a diverse democracy, you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you will agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. The reason India has survived and flourished despite all the stresses and strains of the last 66 years is that we have maintained consensus on how to manage without consensus. That ultimately is the strength of democracy. And I know that in Bhutan we have already seen for the last five years that the ground rules are clear, are accepted and are respected. So disagreement does not become an impediment to democracy and growth, to development and growth. Now, we of course have a challenge you don't have of enormous diversity. But democracy has turned out to be the best way of managing that diversity. The site in May 2004, we are facing a general election uh, by next May, but two elections ago, we had the extraordinary situation of the election being won, I wasn't yet in politics, I was in the UN in those days, by a political party headed by a woman political leader of Roman Catholic uh, background and uh, Italian heritage, who then made way for a Sikh to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim president in a country 81% Hindu. Now this is something that caught the world's imagination because India's founding fathers wrote a constitution for their dreams. We have given passports to their ideals. That one simple moment of political change put to rest many of the arguments over Indian identity. India was never truer to itself than when celebrating its own diversity through democracy. And it wasn't about anybody else. It wasn't about impressing the world. It was simply India being itself. Now, I believe in a democratic India that is open to the contention of ideas and interests within it, unafraid of the prowess or the products of the outside world, wedded to the democratic pluralism that is our civilization's greatest strength and determined to liberate and fulfill the creative energies of our people. That is the transformed Indian democracy of the early 21st century, and its place in today's world owes a great deal to the respect it enjoys as a democracy. While the world moves towards free markets, countries around the world, especially new democracies like Bhutan's, have a major task on their hands. They have to manage the demands of uh, political and, and social integration, economic growth, and good governance, while ensuring that development spreads across the population evenly. If the institutions of the nation are built well, these challenges can be met effectively. Today, the onus lies on us, the actors in this theater called democracy, to see to it that the link between democracy and development creates actionable policies which can make a tangible difference to the lives of the people of our respective countries. Social scientists have shown that democracies, especially ones which are new, and have unified party systems, strong governmental bodies, and protected economies and central banking systems are often in a better position to execute policies which will create inclusive growth for their people. It is necessary that young democracies understand that sustained development will be a result of good governance that allows political and civil rights to flourish. I believe, therefore, that given your five years of experience of democracy for a country like Bhutan, Democracy bodes well for your future development. As the youngest democracy in the world, of course it will do well to take lessons from the past, both of success and failure. Indeed, from the experiences of other democracies, just as 
you studied other democracies before 2008 and apply them to your future course. I can already see that a few are taking place now. I don't know if I'm stepping on political ground, but I've heard that Bhutan is now considering a Right to Information Act. Having seen the difference that this tool has made in India, I have no doubt that it will make democracy and its institutions in Bhutan accountable and transparent in a most wonderful way. Bhutan has also laid emphasis on the education of the people's representatives, requiring graduates. I find that remarkable, barring a party from fielding candidates during the general elections this year on those grounds. So you have managed your democratic transition according to ground rules that you all agree with. Now, yet, of course, you know you have a long way to go. Um, what's interesting, though, is that um, as the country of gross national happiness, you really have an interesting advantage. When you look at the various human development indices that the United Nations Development Program came out with, you find that the top 10 nations are all different forms of democracies. It comes as no surprise that nine of the top 10 economies in the world are also democracies. The only exception is China. In the UNDP's own happiness index, based on the concept that Bhutan devised in the early 70s, the countries that comprise the top 10 are again all democracies. So democracies are growing well, democracies are happy, democracies of human development. What more can we ask for? As such, Bhutan's goal in consolidating its democracy would perhaps be to match these nations and to look to these nations as you build your road to the future. Appreciating the best practices of others could always be helpful. Understanding how Norway, for example, achieved the best human development ranking for its citizens could be useful. New Zealand's social cohesion, Switzerland's education and negligible corruption, the pursuance of personal freedom in the Netherlands, all of these are different attributes that have proved beneficial for their populations in allowing these nations to top the happiness index. In your case, respect for the environment, respect for the culture will also contribute to your happiness. At the same time, access to quick and effective and inexpensive startups apparently was something that gave the Swedish people trust in their governments. All these are different forms in different democracies of the ingredients for success. And you could look at all of them and decide which ones you feel would apply to you. Today, I understand there are challenges of youth unemployment, 7.9% um, according to UNDP report. Employing youth as they flock to your cities will certainly be necessary to take the country forward. Um, and indeed, there is an implicit transformation in your, in your country from a purely agriculture-based economy to one that's much more service and indeed manufacturing-based. So seeing how other democracies have coped with such challenges could be instructive, but always, of course, aligning other people's experience to suit your local conditions. India certainly hopes to be a partner, to continue to be a partner in Bhutan's quest towards progress. Bhutan's democracy has a strong similarity to India's uh, in one sense. We share the same beliefs in a written constitution, planned growth, decentralization, land reforms, principle of citizenship, universal suffrage, and fundamental rights and duties. We have learned a lot from our experiments with democracy since 1947. I was so impressed when your Chief Justice told me that he had been reading so many Indian documents and reports about our failures and our successes with democracy. He even mentioned a report that I had not yet read, the Venkatachalaya Commission report, all of which went into the making of Bhutan's constitution and your political system. So your current democracy already shows the benefit of learnings from other people, other countries, other experiments, successful and unsuccessful. And that, I think, is a wonderful principle to stay with. Bhutan's growth over these five years has been tremendous. Whatever the battles might be with unemployment or inflation, your economy has grown by 9.4% in the year 2012. Your poverty rates have fallen from 36 to 23.2%. Your spending on health and education is one of the highest in the whole of South Asia. The reduction in poverty rates has happened because of your commitment to raising the levels of gross national happiness. Blending the concepts of conservation policies and modernization, identifying economic development, environmental preservation, cultural promotion, and good governance altogether 
as its main components, your GNH reinforces Bhutan's direct commitment to human development. And I congratulate all of you, not just His Majesty, but all of you, for this extraordinary progress. With these achievements, Bhutan has stood shoulder to shoulder with the nations of its neighborhood and sought to contribute, sought to, contribute uh, uh, to the peace and development of the region. India, of course, has steadfastly remained committed to our partnership with Bhutan, which, found its foundation, which finds its foundation in the Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation of 1949 between our countries, which was, of course, updated and signed during the visit to India of His Majesty in February 2007. India has assisted Bhutan with contributions to major projects, including hydroelectricity and infrastructure building, education, free trade, building a train line, and institutional cooperation in the field of elections are just a few of the many spheres where the two countries have come together constructively. The onus is, of course, on us to take the bilateral ties ahead. You've just enjoyed your second general election, a successful one, and your democracy will clearly mature, only mature in the years to come. We in India have the responsibility to remain a worthy ally to your democracy. I can pay homage to the vision of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, whose visit to this country in 1958 has for long shaped the lenses with which we see each other. His famous words said in the city of Paro still ring, ring true today when he said that Indian Bhutan were members of the same Himalayan family and should live as friendly neighbors helping each other. Now, this is a vision that the government of India, I know, is very committed to taking forward with the new government of Bhutan and, and indeed with any government of Bhutan that your democracy and your monarchy will bring forth to deal with us. And that means exploring and being prepared to explore known and unknown avenues. The education sector, which is the area of my own ministry today, is one area which we can certainly explore further. I know that on my very small delegation here, we have uh, one of our very prominent educationists, Mr. Arun Kapoor, who runs the Vasant Valley School in Delhi, who is very keen on looking at the education sector in Bhutan and has been collaborating already at His Majesty's invitation with this sector. Uh, I think we should both continue to stress on education as a means to progress in this world. It's in this sphere that as SARC nations, members of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, we have a wealth of experience that we could share. And certainly, we are always prepared to go beyond our present commitments. I've often argued, now this is before I came into government, so let me say it's a personal view, but one project uh, that I wrote about is, I think, that which could really unite countries like India and Bhutan with our neighbors in Bangladesh and Nepal could be a sub-regional joint water resource management project, which could go beyond just flood management and envisage achieving both the mitigation and the augmentation of the dry season flows of the rivers which run through all four countries. In addition, of course, to the generation of hydroelectricity, which is such a major strength in Bhutan. This kind of mutually beneficial cooperation should be explored to offer a template for the rest of South Asia. And I think it will change the narrative of hostility and stagnation in other parts of the subcontinent into one of cooperation and dynamism. I think for both Bhutan and India, where we have no problems in our relationships, but the, uh, the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation is a valuable platform, which we can use to build a cohesive region, a South Asian region, based on our common democratic principles and commitment to our development, to the de development of our people. <coughs> As um, SARC countries, we can all learn from one another, and we can learn from Bhutan that our environment is a shared blessing, and its future is our shared destiny. Indo-Bhutanese cooperation will help us overcome, in other parts of the subcontinent, prejudiced mindsets, dogmatic doctrines, and self-perpetuating myths across South Asia. Our destinies are inextricably linked, and we have to work together to lift our lives out of underdevelopment and conflict to peace and prosperity. I don't want to continue much longer because I would like very much to respond to your questions and comments. So let me say how privileged I am once again to be here at the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies, and once again thank His Majesty Jigme Khesar Namgyal Wangchuk for having invited me here today. As a representative of the people of India and the government, 
I carry the memories of countless mesmerized fellow Indians who returned back after their time here in Bhutan, changed by its pristine nature and by the warmth of the hospitality that the wonderful people of this nation have offered. In fact, my wife Sunanda is here, her own brother, lived in Bhutan for three years and still can't stop talking about what a wonderful country you have. The progress Bhutan has made and the simple and powerful message of peaceful transformation that you have given to the world has elicited respect from every corner imaginable. Your ways will inspire many in the years to come, and I hope you celebrate and cherish this fact. I can only hope that our friendship goes from strength to strength and that we become effective partners in building a better future for the next generation. As we watch your progress with the second elected government, we wish you growth, harmony, and of course, more happiness that democracy and development will inevitably bring. Thank you, and Jehan. I understand you would like to uh, ask some questions or make some comments. I'm quite open to listen to you. I would love to know what area you're working in. The person who's asking the question might be happy to respond. Is somebody conducting this? Thank you, Your Excellency, for sharing with us your views on India's democracy and development and for your comments and advice on Bhutan's democracy and development and the need for cooperation between nations. I would now like to open the floor for questions to our eminent speaker. However, before I proceed, I would like to request the audience who have questions to raise your hand so that the mic can be passed to you, Ula. And also, another request is to introduce yourself. Due to time constraint, I'm sorry, but I would like to request you to kindly limit your uh, questions to one, and also if it could be kept briefly. Uh, Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for so strongly argumenting in favor of democracy. However, I would like to refer to the recent world. Could you tell of, me, sir, who you are? Just, oh, just sorry. I am Dr. Manohar Ingle from Gidu College of Business Studies, Gidu. I am a professor there. The recent uh, verdict of the Supreme Court, I would like to refer where now a voter can vote for nobody of the candidates if he thinks that either he is not worth representing him or her, or sometimes maybe that he does not want to empower the blunt lawbreakers to make laws for them. Sir, do you think that this is sort of a question mark on democratic process, democratic process and developmental process in India? Thank you. No, I wouldn't uh, say that it's a bad thing. I actually think it's a rather good thing. For those who don't know what the gentleman is asking about, the Supreme Court has ruled now that in our elections, all our elections, in addition to listing the candidates on the ballot paper or the electronic voting machine, there should be one more option, none of the above. So if you don't like any of the candidates, you can vote none of the above. Now, even if none of the above gets more votes than, the, than any of the candidates, still the best candidate still wins, that is whoever has got the most votes still wins, but it sends a very powerful signal. And that is the purpose of introducing this button or this, this option on the ballot paper. I think it's very valuable because it basically convinces um, parties of their interest in avoiding humiliation by presenting candidates who are worthy of support. Can you imagine if in a particular constituency, a candidate of a party wins with fewer votes than none of the above? his credibility and that of his party will naturally be negatively affected. And for that reason, the option actually sends a very powerful message in our democracy. And I think that's a very healthy thing. It can help improve our democracy because parties will then feel the onus 
to actually put forward better and more qualified candidates. Near the camera. Uh, I'm Karma Tenzin. I'm an, an ex police officer. I'm uh, interested to ask just one point that in the democracy and uh, development, uh, Your Excellency mentioned uh, the criminalization of uh, politics or the, the politicians. So when the resilient Indian allow this uh, criminalization of politics, doesn't it hamper the progress of development? So if you could kindly... That's a very fair question, a very good question. I, I, I have to admit that it is actually a flaw in our democracy, not an attribute we are proud of, that uh, in our current parliament of, uh, well, 543 in the lower house, we have 165 members of parliament who have one criminal case or another pending against them. This is a disgrace, and it particularly reflects the fact that in some parts of India, particularly in the north, we have a tendency for tough guys to try and get elected. And instead of their criminal antecedents becoming a discouraging factor, they are actually able to attract votes because they're seen as tough guys and therefore effective representatives for their party interests. I have to say that um, this is a trend that Many of us have been decrying for some years. I wrote a book 16 years ago called India from Midnight to the Millennium, in which I condemned the increasing number of such people in Parliament and called for steps to be taken. It has been difficult to do it partly because while in many of these cases there are criminal charges pending, there have been very few in which there have been criminal convictions as well. As I mentioned in my remarks earlier, if only the rate of convictions would match the rate of indictments, we would have a cleaner democracy in our country. What has now happened, the most recent development, is once again the courts have intervened. In the old days, if you were convicted and you had an appeal, you could go on appealing up the chain for many, many years and you would not be affected. Today, the Supreme Court has taken the position that even, a, uh, an, even if an appeal is in process, once there is a conviction the Member of Parliament or Member of Legislative Assembly stands automatically disqualified from continuing as a Member of Parliament. That's already one big step forward. So already two Members of Parliament whose convictions have occurred after that Supreme Court judgment have lost their seats in Parliament, two already. And the ones who are there now, many of them had previous convictions, but they are pending appeals. If they lose those appeals, even if they win the next election, they will be out. So it's a way of cleansing the system. It will take time. But you know, I have to say that one of the flaws of democracy is always that voters get the leaders they deserve. You know, ultimately we have no one to blame but ourselves for whom we elect. If we want to have leaders whom we are proud of rather than people we are ashamed of, then we should vote for such people. We cannot then turn around and say, oh my God, look at the criminals in politics. If voters have voted for them, then those of us who see that this is wrong have a duty to educate our voters. We have a duty to point out what is the right kind of person to be voted for. In Bhutan, you've already anticipated part of this problem by saying only graduates can be candidates. But let me say very honestly, there is no guarantee that a graduate might not turn out to be a criminal one day. So education alone is not enough. You must have an electorate that is enlightened enough to choose the responsible, decent, honest person and to vote against somebody of a different kind of character who seeks the legitimacy that democracy gives him. In our case, perhaps because our country is so large, populations are so large, each constituency is so large, that has become a bit more difficult. In other words, when you have two million people in a district being represented by an MP, even if 100,000 people know that this is a bad person, he's a criminal, there are still 1.9 million who only see him as a leader of their group or their interest or their community and might still vote him into office.
It's, it's a tough issue about democracy. You will sometimes get bad leaders in a democracy. But that is the price, the small price I believe you pay for the freedoms and other benefits that come with democracy. Secretary, Minister of Information and Communication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. I'm Kinley. I work with the Ministry of Information and Communications with the government here. Thank you very much, particularly for making these two, I think, profound uh, concepts relevant to India and specifically to Bhutan. Now, the uh, premise of my question uh, is that while we are here believe that uh, human development must, must have a higher goal than just GDP, I would like to focus in this context on economic development. And I guess I'm uh, in a way distinguishing economic development from social development, political, uh, social democracy, political democracy. So in terms of economic democracy. The uh, question is, did, did I hear you correctly? Did I, uh, that you dispel the theory or perhaps the thought thinking that, uh, that, you know, that uh, government must maintain a significant control over economic development, especially in developing countries, rather than just the totally free market economy. I, I didn't address that head on. I made an allusive reference to one aspect of it. But I let, let me take the question anyway. It's a very good question. In India, we chose that path. We chose a path of planned and managed economic development. Uh, so have you in Bhutan. Uh, we have found that the nature of that path continues to change. That is that we always had a mixed economy, but the weight of the private sector in our economy has grown, particularly since the liberalization of 1991. We also learned that our initial emphasis on planning through the imposition of licenses, quotas, and permits actually did us damage in terms of our economic growth because it meant that the state became all-powerful the concept was that the state would be a disinterested party acting for the welfare of the people and therefore the state was in the best position to direct economic growth. But in practice what happened was that licenses, permits and quotas began to stifle growth and politicians and bureaucrats began to profit from the power to permit. So anyone in a, in a position to issue a license or a permission or increase a quota was started getting corrupt in the process because the power exceeded. <clears throat> in other words, the monetary value of that power exceeded his official salary or whatever else he had and so corruption came, came through. <clears throat> so we have found ourselves learning from that experience and dismantling more and more of such controls, reducing the number of permissions, no longer telling companies <clears throat> how much they can produce, how much they can expand, how many people they can employ. All of these things that in the earlier, more directive days we were doing. So I would argue that in India, the democratic process has itself not only enabled us to change our models and our approaches, to expand and alter them, but it has also taught the government what the public wants and what the public is prepared to tolerate. One of the most interesting things about economic liberalization in India, a country where there has long been a consensus around the concept of socialism, is that whichever government has come to power, and so in 1991 you had a Congress-led government, 1996 you had the so-called Third Front in which the Communists were a member, 1998 onwards you had the BJP government and the Indian Alliance, then 2004 the Congress came back again. Throughout all of this, the principle and practice of economic reform was not challenged from either the left or the right. So in other words, the, the democratic process provided an electoral test for the acceptability of the economic choices. And had the electoral test failed, then governments might have been tempted to roll back. Instead, today, the feeling is that economic reform in India is irreversible because it has been ratified by successive voters in elections. So I would say that from Bhutan's point of view, 
you would find the same thing. Let us say, for example, that you have certain controls right now that the government considers dismantling. And if your voters don't like it, and in the election campaigns or in the public opinion, you discover that they reject your having dismantled it, then you get a verdict on your economic choice. Whereas if they embrace it and they appreciate it, and you as a result grow faster and better, and more people come out of poverty and more people are prosperous, then your next election could ratify the process of economic choices that you've made. That is essentially what we've seen in India. Honorable Minister, I thank you very much for your inspiring address. My question, what is our, are your views on the state funding of the private media houses, especially in the context of infant and young democratic societies as ours, and uh, in the context of the, especially the Indian experience since the independent days, and especially in recent decades, the challenges of the media in India. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, that's a, a very searching question because in India, uh, the relationship between the state and the independent media houses has come in for a fair amount of attention and indeed controversy. In the days when, uh, uh, soon after independence, we basically had independent media only in those days in the print arena because both radio and later television were initially state monopolies. So the state controlled radio and television, but the print media was, was completely free, was, was independent. However, was it fully independent? Because many print publications survived and prospered on receiving state government advertisements, on uh, the revenues that came from government advertising. Uh, their journalists and editors got subsidized housing in many places. Our land was given at affordable rates for constructing so-called press colonies, uh, press enclaves in Delhi, and that kind of thing. So many argue that already the independent media was being compromised by having received some benefits from the state. And that if a publication became too critical of the government of the day, it could be starved financially by the government withdrawing advertisements from it. So the state was never funding an, inter an independent media house directly, but because the advertisement became an indirect form of blessing a publication or withdrawing that blessing, it became a useful instrument of influence. Now, I don't know what the situation is, Bhutan, so is in Bhutan, so I can only talk about India. But in India, what happened is that that situation has evolved. First of all, uh, the information revolution of the late 80s and early 90s completely freed the broadcast media. So now you have a multiplicity, I mean 300 or 400 private television channels in our country today, including over 100 just in the news area, 24-7 news, in 23 different languages. And as a result, the state medium, um, Doordarshan in the case of Indian television, uh, is essentially now a minority player in the information space in television broadcasting. Similarly, All India Radio. All India Radio is still a fairly significant voice in radio broadcasting, but there are now private FM channels that come on, uh, come on the air. But I would say that it's now a small percentage of the population that relies principally on radio for its news, whereas, say, 30 years ago, Radio was the principal source of news for a majority of the population. That's no longer the case. So the private sector now is in those areas as well. And plus, you have a new medium which didn't exist before. That's the internet. And internet, social media, Twitter, Facebook, all of these various uh, newspaper websites have given people access to information that is well beyond the control of the state, well beyond the control of the government. So now when you come back to your question, it, it means something else. Now, the influence of the media on the state is much more dispersed. And the influence of the state on the media is limited by the multiplicity of choice available. 
it is impossible even for the government of India to compromise every single media outlet available in the country. The government doesn't spend enough money on advertising to be able to influence the media points of view of all the stations available. Now, there are further, more complex levels of debates possible. You can say that government policies could influence the owners of some of these media outlets and that the ownership being influenced can in fact indirectly influence the media. That is, for example, if a tycoon owns a few television stations and that tycoon needs favors in his business from the government, he might be in oil and gas, he might be in petrochemicals, whatever, that the government can influence the media through the owner's other interests. But now they're getting into a very complicated level of argument, which I don't think you were looking at for your, in your question. Let me just say that at, at that, that basic level that I have responded, I would argue now that uh, that's the state's ability to influence independent media directly through financial means, through funding, in India certainly, is very, very limited. Okay. Uh, first, I'll take from, from here. Then there's a, there's a person at the back after that. Thank you, Excellency, uh, for very eloquently and persuasively telling us about the inextricable link between de democracy and development. I am uh, from the Foreign Ministry, Excellency, so my question uh, would pertain to foreign, uh, the challenges of uh, democracy and uh, pursuing a coherent uh, foreign policy. So in the case of India, which is such a huge country and you have uh, different actors at the regional, at the local level, would you say that uh, that would be a challenge where national interests concerning foreign, uh, it could be economic uh, interests or political interests, that you find it difficult to persuade people at the local level to understand and appreciate certain uh, advice that the government may have. And what would you say to countries like Bhutan, so young democracies, where we might have a challenge to have a coherent foreign policy or economic policy? Thank you. That's an excellent question, because you've actually touched on something where the answer is literally in the process of changing in current years. Uh, for the longest time, I would say for, uh, if you take the history of international relations really in the modern era as being about 200 years, I would say that for about 190 of those 200 years, foreign policy was conducted in every country by an elite that understood world affairs, that, uh, that conducted international relations from a position of exclusivity and privilege, and where by and large, by and large, enjoyed the trust of the public. The public had strong views on domestic policy choices in every democracy, but foreign policy was usually left to the government. Uh, it is in fact something that is now changing very, very significantly in all democracies and very strikingly in India because of the complexity of our democracy. In fact, I published a book just a little over a year ago called Pax Indica, which was a study of, of India's place in the world of the 21st century. And even there I argued that for the most part the government had a free hand, but I mentioned a couple of exceptions. Those exceptions have become even more serious in the one and a half years since I wrote that book, and I'll explain in a minute, and there are new exceptions arising which make me feel that if I ever had to rewrite that book a few years from now, I may have to write a totally different argument about the way in which democracy can affect foreign policy. In India today, we are not only a democracy in the, in the sense of multi-parties, multiple parties, different points of view, but we are also a federal state. And Thank you. When you have large numbers of important states where under our constitutional arrangement they have certain rights and privileges and they are ruled by parties which are either not part of the central government coalition or are the opposite, that is the central government is vulnerable to their support when it comes to surviving in the center, then suddenly state parties have an influence on foreign policy that in the past they never did. 
We have entered into the coalition era only in the last two decades. In the first decade of those two decades, there's almost no problem in foreign policy that involved disagreement amongst the parties. In the last few years, the number of such disagreements is rising. So our prime minister goes to Bangladesh and signs an agreement on the, uh, well, he, he intended to sign an agreement on the sharing of the waters of the river Tista, but he cannot do so because the chief minister of the Indian state of West Bengal disagrees and will not let him do it. She at that point is a member of a party which is in the ruling coalition and he could not afford to have her turn against him so he did not go along with it. Subsequently, she has left the coalition. But in the meantime, a second issue has arisen and that is a land swap agreement between the two countries where the agreement has already been initialed, has already been signed between the two countries. The land swap relates to enclaves of Indian territory inside Bangladesh and enclaves of Bangladeshi territory inside India, which is a legacy of the partition of 1947. And a fair agreement was arrived at to end the irritating continuation of this anomaly. But not only has the West Bengal government refused to support it, which is problematic enough, but not, not a deal breaker, but the principal opposition party in Delhi the BJP has become, in my view, somewhat irresponsible by talking about the issue in emotional terms that it's a loss of Indian land and thereby refused to support the constitutional amendment that would be necessary in order to ratify this agreement. Now, without a constitutional amendment to ratify this agreement, the land cannot be exchanged and the agreement essentially fails. In the meantime, we have a very important partner a neighbor who will wonder what the credibility is of signing an agreement or arriving at an agreement with an Indian government. I can give you many more examples like this. We have um, the very passionate views of the state government of Tamil Nadu on the question of relations with Sri Lanka. Delhi has so far managed to maintain a good relationship with the Sri Lankan government, but increasingly this could become a question mark if this government or a future government becomes crucially dependent on a state government in Tamil Nadu uh, in terms of votes for survival in Delhi. So that becomes a question of influence. We've had some awkwardness in our relations with the, the Arab world, uh, an incident where uh, the United Arab Emirates has a company that is in the navigational space, uh, Dubai Ports World. Dubai Ports World bought the international British-based company p and PNO was running a port in the state of Gujarat, but when Dubai Ports World became the owner, the state of Gujarat refused to allow it to operate the port because the state of Gujarat was ruled by a party with a particular point of view on aspects of our relations with the Muslim world. And we, as a central government, feel this is an important thing to do for our important relationship with an Arab country, but the state government essentially cannot be overruled on this. So these are four or five different examples I've given you of areas in which, because we are a multi-party federal democracy, our foreign policy decisions and choices made by the central government have essentially been thwarted by other forces that are not uh, part of the decision-making of the central government. Now, do you blame democracy? Do you blame our federal system? Do you blame the complexity of India? Uh, whatever it is, I don't think Bhutan would have that problem because you're a smaller and more homogeneous state. But it certainly raises some headaches, causes some headaches to the practitioners of foreign policy in a democracy like India in the 21st century. At the back. Sita, at the back. Good evening, sir. I'm Captain Sobham Topke. I'm working with Royal Bhutan Police. So my question is, Supreme Court of India has recently passed a verdict stating that both central and state government to form a board for civil service to protect civil, civil servant and also asks the bureaucrats not to take oral instructions from netas. So how far it will help in good governance, sir? 
I think it will help in good governance. You see, part of the problem is, it's a very complicated issue that uh, the court has, has intervened in. When we won our democracy, our freedom from the British, we adopted the British idea of a distinction between the elected political class that controlled the government and which could be changed every five years by an election and the permanent civil service which had lifelong security of tenure and could not be changed as the political government changed. That principle remains. But in practice, when a new government comes or a new minister comes, the minister has the power to insist upon the transfer of his senior officials or the officials working in the civil service. He cannot fire them because they have security of tenure. He can only fire them for very egregious acts of corruption or criminality. But he can get them transferred. And what has happened a lot in independent India is that when a bureaucrat has been seen to be independent or stubborn in holding up the rule book against the sometimes capricious wishes or the motivated wishes of an Indian political minister, the minister simply gets a bureaucrat transferred until a more pliant bureaucrat is appointed to do what he wants him to do. You see, in our system, it's not supposed to work that way. In our system, a minister can say to a civil servant, you can do this and this, and the civil servant can say, sorry, sir, it's against the rules. These are the rules. I cannot, therefore, implement your order. In practice, very few bureaucrats or civil servants do that, either because they want to curry favor with their political masters or because they could be transferred out at a moment's notice. Now, there have been a number of celebrated cases in India where some officers who have been unusually either pig-headed, if you want to put it negatively, or principled, if you want to put it positively, have in fact been transferred very often. There are a couple of cases of people who have been transferred 40 times in, 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 in their careers. And, and therefore, the Supreme Court has said that every civil service posting must now have security of tenure as well. Not just the fact that they, during their career they cannot be fired, but that if you're appointed to a particular position, let's say you're secretary of a particular ministry, the Supreme Court insists now that you will be given a fixed term, let's say two years or three years as secretary, and that term is so solid that it, merely because you disagree with the minister, you cannot be transferred. This is raising some very fundamental and complicated questions. In one way it is good, it means you'd have an impartial, objective civil service that is not subject to the whims of political masters. But the other problem is that a political minister coming with the mandate of his voters to pursue a particular course of action may find that the will of the voters as represented through him is actually being thwarted by the opposition of an obstinate bureaucrat. And in a democracy which should prevail? It's a very tough question, but the theory of democracy would tell you that the wishes of the voter should be more important than that of the unelected civil servant. But if the unelected civil servant simply refuses to do something, with the new Supreme Court ruling, nothing can be done till he finishes his term of office in that job. It is going to raise some very interesting and complicated questions in our democracy. Somebody might even try and pass a new uh, law or an amendment to challenge the verdict. It will be a very interesting question. The other one that you mentioned is, of course, that uh, they should not take oral instructions. I think that's a very healthy practice. No one can argue against that. If a minister gives you an instruction that, uh, that you, you, you are uncomfortable with, uh, you tell him to give it to you in writing, that's fine. Then the minister takes the political responsibility. Too often ministers have made civil servants the fall guys. By giving them orders orally, the civil servant then executes the order in writing. And if later there is a problem or a case or a charge or even a criminal uh, a charge against that particular decision, it is the civil servant who is on the paper trail and not the minister who gave the oral order. So now you cannot give an oral order, you have to give it in writing. That's also very, very sensible. The first one is a bit more complicated. The last question for tonight, La. Sit up. Here. Uh, 
Uh, my name is uh, Bin Soongdi. I'm from the private sector. Uh, Your Excellency, having come from the world's uh, largest democracy, do you see further rooms of improvement for the success of Bhutan's uh, democracy hereafter? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you well. Could you uh, raise the mic a little closer? Yeah. Do you see uh, further rooms of improvement for the success of uh, democracy hereafter in Bhutan? Oh. And, and uh, also your words of wisdom on uh, maintaining, the, maintaining Bhutan's uh, peaceful uh, relationship with our neighboring countries, particularly to the north and south where Bhutan share borders from the context of uh, emerging uh, democracy and development. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I'm always hesitant to preach to others about what they should do in their democracy. In fact, at the UN, I became slightly notorious once by saying that democracy is rather like love. It has to come from within. You cannot instill it from outside. But certainly well-wishers can provide the candlelights and the romantic music like love to make democracy flower. And I think to that degree, India would be very content to playing the romantic music and, and, and offering the candlelight uh, if Bhutan asks for it in helping with its democracy. Just as we were asked to give some advice on the conduct of the first elections, that sort of thing we're very happy to do at any time. That, uh, that the Bhutanese uh, government says to India, look, we would like some advice on such and such, we will be happy to come. And for example, you're doing a Right to Information Act. If you want one of our information commissioners or former information commissioners to come and tell you how the act has worked in India, what has worked well, what has not worked well, what the pitfalls are, uh, you want that to be done discreetly, you want it to be done publicly, whatever, India will never say no to such a request. India tends not to want to thrust itself forward. Uh, we don't feel that, um, that we have a, a, a proselytizing mission for democracy. We like democracy for ourselves. We think those countries that freely embrace democracy uh, will actually be better off for it. But we would never say to another country, we think you should do this or that unless you ask us. If you ask us, we will give you the benefit of our experience uh, with whatever you're asking us about. Having said that, the five years of Bhutan's experiment with democracy have been so successful that I am very confident that you will continue very positively down this path. You also have a very enlightened monarch to keep an eye on the process. Uh, and you have a very strongly, uh, I would say, a very rich culture in which you are all very strongly anchored. And that again gives its own stability and continuity. Uh, which is a, a great advantage that, that you have in Bhutan. So I am, I am very confident, almost to the point of being complacent, uh, that the five years of success of this experiment would suggest that the future for, for Bhutanese democracy is very bright indeed. Because with each passing year, the habits of democracy get entrenched amongst the political classes, amongst the voters, amongst the citizens, and people simply get used to doing things in a certain way that fits in with democracy. On foreign policy, I think you know that your foreign policy has been managed very, very adroitly. We have a very special relationship with Bhutan, and that special re relationship remains very secure, even while Bhutan has been opening itself up to closer relations with other countries. And I must say that uh, uh, it, is to the it is a tribute to Bhutan's very sensible management of its foreign policy, that there has never been an issue either with India or with other countries about the way in which you have conducted yourself. So all I can say is I hope that Bhutan will continue in that spirit. We certainly would like to see ourselves as close partners, allies, neighbors, friends of Bhutan and that we hope that nothing will jeopardize that relationship. But at the same time, we understand that Bhutan has to manage good relations with other countries in the world and in any way that we can assist uh, or, or, or help, we are always available to do that. But we fully respect Bhutan's sovereignty, Bhutan's, uh, uh, shall we say, awareness of its own needs and its own situation. And I know that we will expect to march hand in hand or side by side in the years ahead as we have been doing in the years to now. Thank you all very much. You've been a wonderful audience and these were excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, and 
to the wonderful and enthusiastic audience for their interactive se session. I am confident all of us will leave this hall very enlightened and inspired, and the discussion will leave a huge impact on our minds. Your Majesties, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we end the second forum lecture, I would like to invite the project coordinator of the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies, Mr. Thong Rinzin, to give the closing remarks. Your Majesty the King, Your Majesty the Gelton, Honorable Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. At an informal meeting of a group of highly intellectual people from India and Bhutan in April this year in Paro, a lady in the group said, Bhutan is unique because here you have a leader with a vision. She was, of course, referring to His Majesty the King. I said, yes, ma'am, and Rick's is one such vision of our King. Ladies and gentlemen, great leaders have great goals, goals that are difficult to achieve but not unachievable, and goals that can change the destiny of a country or even that of mankind. Rick's was some, one such goal of His Majesty the King. Democracy was a priceless gift we received from the Golden Throne. Rix is yet another. And as an avenue to promote leadership, discourse, and governance, the timing, milieu, and relevance of the establishment of Rix could not have been more appropriate. As the Leadership Development Institute, and a think tank on governance, strategies, and policies. RICS will play a critical role in further promoting and upholding the long-term peace, stability, and progress of our country. It will also com comprehensively supplement and complement the efforts of the Royal Government in developing the intellectual capacity of our human resource and framing sound national policies and strategies. Through events like the one tonight, Rix also provides a golden opportunity for the creation of an academic community in Fensuling and nearby places such as Gedu and Samsi. Further, Rix will play an instrumental role in further strengthening the close ties of friendship between Bhutan and India. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Bhutan and her people can never thank his Majesty the King, enough. On behalf of the Institute, its governing board, faculty, staff and course participants, and on my own personal behalf, I would like to express our deepest gratitude to Dr. Shashi Tharoor for delivering this thought-provoking and wonderful Friday Forum lecture here at RICS, despite your busy schedule back home. We are truly honored to have Your Excellency in our midst this evening it really means so much for an institute that is just a couple of months old. So thank you very much, Your Excellency. I would also like to thank the 23 course participants who have helped us in whatever way is possible in hosting this Friday Forum Lecture, despite the fact that they are undergoing a very intensive senior executive leadership program. I would also like to thank the officers and colleagues at the HM Secretariat in Thimpu, Chukha Dongkhak and Finsling Dongkhak officials, Finsling Tromde, Royal Bhutan Police, Royal Bhutan Army, Laki and Druk Hotels, and all other agencies and individuals who have helped us to organize this event tonight. Thanks are also due to my own staff here at Rex, who have worked very hard to put up this show. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the distinguished guests and participants for joining us today, and we look forward to your participation in the Friday Forum Lectures in future too. Before I conclude, uh, 
as a token of appreciation and goodwill from the institute we would like to uh, we would like to actually offer a butter lamp to your excellency thank you thank you very much and tashikilela